today I want to talk about, um, you know, the, the idea of freshness. So we've spent three weeks, and if you've been a part of this fast, fasting is a manner by which we refresh, and it also becomes a way to stay fresh. Um, but we're going to talk about staying fresh as we move forward um, throughout this year. So when I, th- when I talk about freshness, when I think about freshness, my mind goes to, well, I, my, actually, it's, it's kind of sad, but my go to staleness. I go, well, if, if I've got to work to stay fresh, that means stale is a real reality. You know, and I, I don't know, I don't like anything stale. I don't know about you. I don't like stale bread. I don't like stale conversations, you know. Um, stale um, is lifeless. But it's an inevitability that we will get stale, okay, if there isn't some fresh practices to keep us from being stale. The, the order of the universe is to disorder, not order. So in order there to be order, there has to be something that gets inserted and injected to bring it to order. So um, you have to protect fresh, and you've got to build freshness in. So again, my mind worked to, okay, so when I'm stale, um, there, there, are, there are reasons, um, there is a path that I end up following when I get stale. So I don't want to project um, and say I know how you get stale or even that you do get stale. But I'm telling you I do, and I want to share with you three reasons why I have found out I do get stale, okay? And so there may be some correlations with you. The first is stale comes through just comp- the complications of life, that, that life is just busy, it's complicated, it's demanding, and so what ends up happening is those complications and demands generally take me away from the presence of God. It takes me away from time of prayer. It takes me away from time of pondering. It takes me away from, from spending any time alone with the Lord. Or even if I am, like I come into a church service, that, that all the, my mind, your mind doesn't stop, and it's just racing along all the things that had to be done. Or be, you know, if you ever want to create a good to-do list, try praying. Because your mind immediately goes to what you need to do. I've actually learned to pray with a pad. And I'm saying, okay, I'm not going to be able to completely stop my mind, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray. If something pops in my mind, I'm going to jot it down, but I'm going to leave it on the pad and not keep it in my mind, all right? And so until you kind of train yourself that the enemy is, is doing that kind of stuff because, listen, it is his authority and job to keep us stale, all right, so complications of life does. Here, here's, a, here's another reason why I get stale. I get stale because of the opportunities of life. What's that mean, Pastor? Well, you may have heard the phrase that, that there is great has an enemy. Good is the enemy of great. There are a lot of good opportunities um, that come our way. And you go, man, I, you know, I, I don't need to miss that opportunity. Or here's a great, here, you know, it's a really good opportunity. But, but God has great things for us. And if the enemy can't keep us busy and demanding, many times I've seen him work, then there becomes a lot of good opportunities, things that we would like to do. But when those good opportunities keep us from the greatness of God, they're actually, they're actually deterrent. They're, they're, they're not adding to our life. They actually start taking away from our life. All right? So we have to be careful even with good opportunities. I've, I've used this analogy for years and years and years. If you want to derail a train... There are two significant ways to do this. One would be you put something on the track so that the train hits something on the track and then it goes off. But the other way is to force the train to go too fast for a curve. And so it has too much speed for the, for the degree of the turn and it jumps the tracks. And that's kind of what I mean by the good. I also get stale because things get hard. The hardness of life the difficulty of life can create staleness in me because it takes me away from, once again, all these things are what takes me away from um, the presence of God or pursuing the presence of God. The soon as something hard comes, the two questions that I ponder with is, what did I do now? The second one is, what do I do now? And they're both wrong presuppositions. The first presupposition of what did I do now is that somehow God's punishing me because I'm doing something, because I'm in a hard season or hard something, right? So that's the first thing. It's, it's a wrong presupposition. Both of those subjects, what, what did I do now and what do I do now, has me as the center, has me as the object, and I've got really, really good news and bad news all wrapped in the same thing. It's not all about us. We are not the center. Bad things happen for a lot of different reasons, and not just because of something I did 
So what, what, did I, what did I do now puts you in a bad position, I think an awkward position with God, because God doesn't punish us. Now, God disciplines. He corrects out of because he loves us. God doesn't punish us. Right? His, his idea is grace. He's the one that died for us, okay? So grace is how he operates, not punishment. So the enemy wants to change that in your. He wants to change your thinking. He wants to keep the thinking around, you know, what did I do now? The what do I, what, what do, I do now? Um, uh, w- w- if you have assembled any kind of team uh, for anything, any work project, any, any community project, whatever, the, the goal really is when you build team, let me help you if you don't know this, you want people smarter than you are on your team. Okay? You, when you build a team, you don't want to be the smartest person on the team because then everything rests with you. Okay? So when you say, what do I do now? Why would you ask the least experienced person on your team to give strategy moving forward in a difficult project? Right? But when we put ourselves as the most um, strategic thinker, we've eliminated God as the most strategic thinker. So when I go, what do I do now, the presupposition is you have to fix it. But when you're a child of God, you don't have to fix it. You have to follow it. Okay? And so following it asks God, the, most, the smartest person in the room, what do I do now? Um, my overarching point is when I'm stale, I do me no good and I do everybody else no good. When I'm fresh, I do me a lot of good and I do everybody else around me a lot of good. That's another reason why the enemy wants to keep us stale. So I want to focus on how praise and worship, how praise and worship are spiritually lethal weapons. Praise and worship, spiritually lethal weapons. I, I, I see praise, and you, you can't really define, d- divide them up as, as neatly as this, but I see praise as celebration, and I see worship as adoration. Okay? So that there's a celebration part of my praise, and then the, when, I, when I'm worshiping, it seems to be a lot, lot more maybe adoration. But worship... Praise and worship are like diamonds. They're many-faceted. Um, serving one another is worship. Um, giving is worship. Um, following Jesus and my actions are worship. Prayer is worship. Studying the Word is worship. Worship is giving God the attention He deserves. And so even a Scripture says that whatever your hand finds to do, do it to the glory of God. That Whatever we do, we can do it as worship unto Him. But we do something unique in here every Sunday morning, that is a culturally odd practice, and is that we sing together. I mean, it is culturally odd and somewhat awkward singing in a group. Now, not long ago, I was, uh, Gene and I were drones, we were up here at this intersection, and we were at a stoplight, and we were listening to a radio station. And apparently, the woman in the car next to us was listening to the very same radio station. Because she was enjoying it. She played every instrument. She did every dance move and knew every single word. And it was so hilarious to hear the singer singing here and watching her sing. sing today. It was, it's fun. Now, I'm, I'm sure if she noticed someone was noticing her, she probably would have stopped. Or maybe not. She might have ran around the car. I don't know. But in essence, where do you ever go and sing in a big group of people? So I thought about myself. Where do I go anywhere that groups of people sing? And I only came up with one, Bridgestone. When I go to a Preds game, I sing. Let it be, let it be, let it be, Lord, let it be. Speaking words of wisdom. Woo! <laughs> right? We, we, we sing because the environment's singing. There is a call on the ice for those of you who don't like Hockey, there's a call on the ice. They're reviewing the call. It's favorable to the home team. So, I mean, everybody. I mean, first game I was there, what are they doing? Oh, how do I do it? Right? Because you want to be a part. You want to connect yourself to the part that everybody's doing. It's a connecting piece. Singing together is a connective piece. It, It brings us together around the same thing, around God, and we get to participate together in that event. Charles, um, Charles Wesley. Um, well, let me get to that in a minute. Here, maybe, maybe it helps you if you understand how unmistakably um, the worth of this risk of singing together is. Here's Psalm 22 and 3. Let me tell you what it does. Uh, the New American Standard Version says, Yet you are holy, O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. You are holy, 
you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Other translations say it in a way that may be more familiar to some of you. It says that he inhabits the praise of, our peop- the praise of his people. And it's actually not the best translation of that verse. That verse kind of implies that um, we sing and God shows up. Well, that, that's not theologically accurate. God's here. I think what's, what's more theologically accurate is we sing and we show up. All right? And so, so it's not that he just, oh, okay, they're singing now. I, we, we, we can go, Trinity. But when you see that he's enthroned on our praises, here's what I think it ends up saying. It says, as I praise, I start witnessing the position of Christ on the throne. That my singing then engages the triumphant God who died and resurrected and is now at the right hand of the Father. He, he is enthroned. When I'm praising, when I'm worshiping, I see him enthroned. And when we see him enthroned, we see his beauty. We see his majesty. We see his strength. And can't you see how the enemy would want to keep all that clouded, veiled off, that God is beautiful, awesome, majestic, and it's when we praise that we see him on his throne. And when you see God on his throne, then it's amazing how everything else in our lives seems to then go back to second, third, fifth, sixth, tenth place when we see him on his, when we see him on his throne. It, it opens our eyes to that. Let me take a side road here real quick and talk about clapping because I've always thought clapping in church is awkward. I'm just, I'm just being Yankee on you today, okay? I didn't grow up in southern church. Clapping always felt awkward to me. Why does God need us to clap for him? And here's what I realized. I realized that God doesn't have a need for applause like we have a need for applause. Okay, so let's not put our, let's not project our needs onto what God needs. God doesn't need our applause. We don't applaud men when we applaud. Our applause is another connective action that happens in worship. Listen to Psalm 47. Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is awesome. He is the great king over all the earth. He will subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. When I applaud and I applaud the Lord, it is an expression of my joy that he is, has exalted above my enemies. It's a, it's a triumph. I can shout. I don't do that very much. I can shout, but I can cl- I clap my hands in joy. And his, I'm connected to his victory that he's on the throne. And my applause is my connecting peace to him. It's not applauding a person. It's not a filler for a service. It is an act of worship and recognition who he is and what he's done. And, you know, anytime, have you been, been anywhere, whether a sporting event or, or a concert or, or a symphony or whatever, when there is spon- no one at the end of a concerto says, now it's time to clap. Wow, gosh, come on. Am I telling the truth? What happens? It just erupts. It just happens. It, 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 it's Jesus going in, into the city on Palm Sunday. And his followers are, they're praising him. And, and the Pharisees say, you need to, you need to keep, them, keep this down because you keep this up, then the Romans are going to come and it's going to be a big mess. And Jesus gives this unbelievably revelatory statement. He said, listen, the king has just come, now my paraphrase, the king has just come into the city. And if no one else around here is going to recognize it, my creation the rocks strewn all along these walls, they're going to burst forth in praise. Now, which do you think is going to cause the biggest commotion? That the walls begin praising or that my people do? See, so, so it, is, it is a spontaneous, it's not on command. I hate when people tell me what to do. Clap your hands, sit down, stand up, do this. It, but why, why, why is it done for the platform sometimes? But that's, that's what leading is called. Leading is called sometimes because when it feels awkward, culturally, socially awkward, there should be a man or woman of God who helps us follow into the presence of God. That's why they lead in singing. That's why they will lead in worship. That's why we'll lead saying, let's put ourselves in a posture of receiving. Let me lead and help us in a, in a manner of applause and adoration to the Lord. You can still sit there with the hands in your pocket. There, there isn't police running around taking notes. But it's, it's an effort to lead us into the presence of God because praise and worship in any form or fashion, from giving to serving 
to open our mouth, leads us into the presence of God, allows us to see him enthroned. All right, so let's jump, let's just jump back a little bit to the, to the singing thing. Um, I've heard people all my life say the church shouldn't be too emotional. The church shouldn't be too emotional. Um, but I think the, 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 bigger, the bigger issue, and the, the point they go to, well, it's a distraction to people and people just trying to draw attention to themselves. And they might. And, but guess what? It becomes then my responsibility to, do, to, to, to handle that. Okay? So, but, but I think less emotion has always been the church's problem, not too much emotion. So John Wesley starts the Methodist church. Okay? He has a brother named Charles. Charles wrote over 6,500 hymns. All right, so John preached, Charles sang, apparently. Um, and he, Charles had this, this comment. He said, beware of singing as if you were half dead. But lift up your voice in strength. Be no more afraid of your voice, no more ashamed of it being heard than that when you sing the songs of Satan. Now, leave it to a songwriter to embellish a little bit. But th- what, a, what a great thing to hold on to. Beware of singing as if you were half dead, but lift up your voice and strength. Maybe to help you if I tell you, if I teach you that God sings. I wonder if that would help. Here's Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but we rejoice over you with singing. How's that? That God rejoices over you with singing singing. Here's Psalm 42, 8. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my, of my life. God sings over us, especially at night. In other words, especially in times of darkness, especially in times feeling despair. Jesus sings. Now, this one someone pointed out to me. I didn't know Jesus sang. Jesus, when did you, when'd you sing? Matthew 26, 30. After the Passover, it finishes. I've, I mean, I've read this verse of Scripture a thousand times. I mean, when I lead communion, I read the passage out of Matthew. But here's how it ends. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus leads the disciples in singing. For my Baptist friends, he sang the first and third verse. <laughs> Christ. Unbelievable. Jesus sings. Colossians 3.16, we get directed to sing. Let the message of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. But through what? Psalms, hymns, songs of the Spirit. Singing to God with gratitude in our hearts. It might feel culturally awkward, but the Trinity sings and sings to us and has given us the ability to sing. Staying fresh in the business of life, the opportunities of life, the hardship of life, I'm, I believe it lends itself to how praise and worship makes us fresh. Now, a little insight into me, you know, the Yankee, New Jersey boy. My mom was of the persuasion that seeing what was done before she got to hear the message. My mom all lived from the shoulder up, Okay. And so I inherited that, that I, you know, no, you bring me, you bring me an expository word out of Scripture, and, and this is what I'm going to latch on to, and the rest of the stuff, you know, is just perfunctory until we get to the pastor speaking. Now, my mom was also a teacher, so she didn't believe in a lot of fluff either. I have all her Bibles. I still have all her notes, and it's a great, it was a great legacy to leave me except for one thing, that I finished college, and I finished seminary, and I actually even, even, finished one position at a church as a student pastor, and I didn't know what it even meant to engage God in worship like that. Meaning then there was a lot of worship up here, there was a great appreciation for the word, but but, but not a lot was going on right here. Now obviously I'd given my life to serve him, but still something was here. And then at the church, we were in Texas, and the worship pastor was a songwriter and worship leader. And in the afternoon on Wednesdays, he would slip into the sanctuary, all dark, and he would just play and sing. And I started hearing him, and I started going into the sanctuary without him knowing, and I would lay down on a back pew, and I would just listen to him worship, and I would cry. And I started recognizing that's what it means to engage God emotionally, not just intellectually. 
And it was amazing. I, what, I was 22, 25, I was 28 years old. And I, and I gave my heart to the Lord when I was eight. So it took me 20 years. Now, look, I got friends, you know, and I, yeah, she, one of them's there. And I haven't, <laughs> it might take me another 28 years to get there. But you might, when I'm, when I'm worshiping, I'm, but this is me trying not to jump. <laughs> and it's not all about melody. I'm not a melody guy. I don't understand it. But, man, when, when you connect a strong, theologically grounded root of who Jesus is, and you connect that to music that has a way of capturing our heart, I'm telling you, that's staying fresh. It is the reason why we go to the effort to produce that CD. Not that you don't have access to Lord knows how many, but these generally have been songs written by people you go to church with that worship in this room, charged with the ministry of leading us in worship. And these are ones in which they have been given for our body. And that's why we produce the CD. But here, let me, let me move on. Um, 2 Chronicles chapter 20 is an amazing passage of Scripture, one of my, one of my favorite, because it shows the power of praise and worship. It shows the power, okay, and how we engage God in that way. So I want to read you that, give you a quick little synopsis of that before we go into our own time of prayer and worship. Second Chronicles chapter 20 says, After this, the Moabites, the Ammonites, with some of the Menunites, came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people call, came and told Jehoshaphat, A vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It's already in Hazan Tamar. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. Now, we've come through 21 days. Some of you have taken some portion of that. But I, what, what I want you to recognize is the power of the fast isn't in the amount of days. Okay? The power of the fast is who we're fasting towards, who we're drawing towards. Because in an instance of trauma or drama, there isn't the lead time. There was no lead time here. So he declared a fast for all the people, and they went after it. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord, prayer. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Verse 5, Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nation. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name, and we will cry out in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. But now, here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. You notice the prayer? I want to, prayers aren't all flowery, okay? He, the first prayer is he's not reminding God who he is. Who is he reminding God who he is? He's reminding himself and everybody else who God is. God doesn't need a, rem, a memory, but everybody else did, all right? In the prayer. And he's saying, he, you can see a little complaint. We came into this land, you told us to leave them alone, and now they're coming after us. All right? Verse 11. See how they're repaying us by coming to drive us out of possession you gave us as an inheritance? Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Verse 13. All the men of Judah, with their wives and children and little ones, stood there before the Lord. I want to pause there. You know what that is? They anticipated a response from God. you got to love this. How many times do your prayers or my prayers look like maybe we had gone into a doctor's office, we told the doctor everything that was wrong with us. When we finished, we said, 
thank you very much, and we walked out the door. We would have no expectation of that, would we? We would expect a diagnosis. We'd expect do this, do that, change this, change that. But how many times does prayer look like us unloading and then hiatus? Where, where, where is the anticipation that God is going to respond? And so they waited for the Lord. My, my mom and my grandmother would have called that praying through in the day. They had, a, they had a hung tight until something changed. Something changed in their heart, and they felt a release or peace or something changed in the circumstance, but they were, they were there for the duration. We, we don't have enough persistence and patience in prayer now. I don't believe we do. I, I, I believe that's cultural. Culture changes. We change. I believe there's more things at our disposal to fix stuff, so we lean into ourself before we ever lean into God. But here, here's what happens with, with this anticip anticipation of response. Verse 14. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeul, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite, and a descendant of Asaph as he stood in the assembly. Pastor, why the genealogy in the middle of this? Why, why are we told who this guy is now? I'll tell you why. Uh, at least my conjecture, okay? That's well, more than conjecture, but Jehaziel is never mentioned before in Scripture. This is his first mention ever, and he's never mentioned again. So one, it tells me you never know how God's response is going to come and who's going to come through. God rarely brings solutions to problems from what you have already determined is the source of the... You with me? God has the ability to pull this stuff from everywhere, and so he wants to identify Jehaziel. The writer wants to identify this guy because he has come with the word of the Lord. He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For this battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow march down against them. They will be climbing up from the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight in this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Judah and Jerusalem, if any time in Scripture they repeat something, it's worth repeating. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out and face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Notice, when, when God has to tell us not to be afraid or not to be discouraged, he's telling us that because there's something to be afraid of and to be discouraged about. Okay? In the sense, in our, in our own sense, he would not be saying it if it wouldn't have brought forward discouragement. But it brings it, it brings it forward. There are things in your life that brings forward discouragement, that bring forth fear. And he's saying, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged. But interestingly enough, he doesn't say, because it's, it's all going to go away. What he says is, you will face them tomorrow. We need a little bit more spiritual backbone in us, okay? A little bit more trust in who God is. That when it doesn't, doesn't go away, that we can, we can face, we'll all face it. We're not facing it in our own power. They had gotten a word from the Lord. This is battle is not yours, it's God's, but go and face it. Here's how it turns out. Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down and worshiped before the Lord. Then some Levites from the Kohathites and Korites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. The praise and the worship there happened because God spoke, but they were faith-based praise and worship because nothing yet has changed. You with me? Okay, verse 20. Early in the morning they left for the desert of Tekoa. As he set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah, and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. And I love verse 24, 21. After consulting the people. Now, God had told them what to do. He didn't tell them exactly how to do it. And so you hear Jehoshaphat getting together with some people and saying, Okay, he's told us to walk, but how should we do it? And, and collectively, this is what, this is what surfaced. Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out ahead of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Now, I've always read that and think, think that's bad military strategy because they don't know you're coming. 
And if they don't know you're coming and you send a bunch of people up front to sing loud, this is going to give away your position. Someone right after the first service who leads or had led, he's retired, tactical teams for law enforcement said, Pastor, I respectfully disagree. And he said, here's why. He said, when we would put a force together, you put your most advanced and your most experienced people at the front and at the back. Because the first ones have to be the most trained to engage the enemy. And on the back, you've got to be careful that no one's coming around the other side. And it just hit me. This wasn't a military battle. This is a spiritual battle. Everything you face is spiritual. Because the enemy wants to leverage it and turn it and take you out. So that makes everything we face spiritual. It doesn't remove, there's a natural limit to this, okay? But everything's spiritual. So it's a spiritual fight. In a spiritual fight, you want to lead with praise and worship. Because there is an acknowledgement of whose battle this is. There's an acknowledgement of where the strength's going to come from. Notice they said, and the Lord will be with you. That's what Jehaziel said. Go out and face it, and the Lord will be with you. Well, when I'm praising and worshiping in that, then he, and he's enthroned on the praises of his people, are you with me? Then what we see is we see him high and lifted up. We see his splendor. We see his majesty. And we don't see and are not impacted by all the threats that are coming our way. Here's how it ends. 22, as they began to sing and praise, as they began, it, it, it is, the, grammar, the grammar implies a, a, a coexisting thing happening. As they began to sing, something else happened. It, the, the grammar helps see that there is a correlation between these two things. As they began to sing praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and the Moabites rose up against the man of Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped destroy one another. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks, and it would have been the people who praised and, and sang, they would have been the first, they'd have been the first there, first on site. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder. This is here to give you an idea how vast the army was. And they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value, more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect it. Okay, so that gives you the scope. I want you to see the scope. The writer wants you to see the scope of what was there. All right? So some of you have a higher tolerance for pain than others. And so we, 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 we tackle stuff on our own at a certain level, but all of us have a threshold where the pain exceeds our ability so the demonstration here is this was above anybody's ability. On the fourth day, they assembled. Here's the last part. Team, go ahead and get ready. On the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Baraka where they praised the Lord. This is why the valley, this is why it's called the valley of Baraka to this day. The valley of Baraka means the valley of blessing. So I want you to hear this. Israel's enemies were working on a deadly plan but God ambushed them in the valley of blessing. These are the words of Joseph when he sees his brothers. When he says, what you meant, he tells his brothers who had basically sold him off, what you intended for evil, God has done for the salvation of many. There is a valley of in which the enemy wants to take us out. And it is in that valley that God declares it after victory, a valley of blessing. So to me, it is a, it is a clear indication of how we are to, one, live our lives fresh and how we are to face even the hardest of hardship that we lead with praise and worship. Is there a risk of me singing out loud in a group of people? Is there a risk of me coming forward for prayer in a large group? 
I would contend the only risk is not doing it. I would contend risk isn't where I am. Risk is where God is. And when I move towards God, the risk goes down. Now, worship looks different for a lot of people. There are, there are personalities. Look, you, you might think I'm an extrovert. I am not an extrovert. I don't know what I am exactly, but I know. I, I, in the first service, I just said I was a vert because uh, I'm not necessarily an introvert or an extrovert. I, but if you brought me to a party, I would be the guy in the corner waiting to just to find one person to talk to. I would not be anywhere else. And so I understand personalities play into the reserved nature of someone. I'm not suggesting that sitting quietly is any less worship than standing and jumping up in circles. Only you get to make that determination of where are you, where, where is the heart. And I, I would just say it changed, it, it, it changed me by allowing the emotion not to just be trapped into my Yankee little squared body that had to have everything measured out and figured out and it had to be all be intellectually secure and, and all that stuff. And when I started, my relationship with the Lord started changing. It, it, it took on much more son, dad, than it did boss, servant. Does that make any sense? And so much of my life was, yes, sir. And not as much, yes, dad. That just hit me. Yes, Dad takes away, what did I do now? It takes away, what do I do now? Saying, yes, Dad. Healing comes in the presence of God. Emotional healing, physical healing, spiritual healing, freshness. And I just didn't want us to, I don't want us to get into this routine. We come in here, we sing three songs, pastor speaks, and we leave. Um, that's a seminar with a little entertainment. We don't do seminars in entertainment because there's, there's no life in that. I can grow, I can go to a seminar and be entertained, and there's, you know, there, there can be some posture there, but that's not what we do here. What we do here is we want to be in the presence of God. We're in the presence of God in His Word, in the presence of God when we sing, when we pray for one another. We're going to give here in a moment, ladies or gentlemen, whoever's receiving our offering today, I want you to take, take your place, because offering is worship. And in our, in our culture, In our Western culture, pastor talks about giving and, and people's mind goes to, you know, about what, what I got to give up. And, and can you hear me from my heart that when we give in an offering, it is not about what we give up. We give an offering is, is worship. It's, it's gratitude. It's an acknowledgement of God as our provider. I mean, it is a big, it's a big deal. Now, if it's paying a bill, if it's paying a budget, if it's, well, I should help, that's not worship. And so I would think that it has very little impact on your heart. And, and God wants everything to impact our heart. So that's why I don't read anywhere in Scripture where he says, I love a really, really big giver. I heard you chuckle. Or I really, really, really love a little giver. Scripture says, I love a cheerful giver. 
big or little comes out of whatever he's placed in my hand from, to, that he's entrusted to me. And there are times he's entrusted me things that I can be a big giver. And there's other times where I'm, I can, I'm a little giver. I think that's why it's, he even talks about around a percentage. God, God seems to care, care more about it being cheerful and first than anything else. First, first fruits. That's what a tie means. It's the first. And cheerful. Cheerful meaning I understand what I'm doing and how I'm doing it is worship. Now, I don't know why I went off into that, but it's necessary. And it's not just something we do in the middle of service. So even this is turned around for us to worship. But in a moment, these, these cards on your, on your chairs are for um, during our time of worship, if there is something you've been praying for, fasting for, and you want other people to join with you, I want you to take the time to write it. You, you, you know, you can't write a book, but you can, you can get the essence. And then as we're, as we're singing, just, just like Jehoshaphat and the arm, they, they, as they were praising, they, they moved forward. I want you to just put it down here on, on the platform. Our prayer teams, our staff, gather these together. And, and my commitment is the month of February, we're going to go after these hard in prayer. One of the loving, most loving things you can do for someone is pray for them. Come in and join and pray for them. You may want to have someone anoint you with oil and pray. If you're sick emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, you want someone to pray for you, all you have to do is come up. Someone will be here to pray with you. So you might want some time just alone to pray. But as, as we're singing, I give I, I, that, that opportunity is for you to do. So they're going to start leading us again. After, after the, the offering uh, receptacle goes by, if you want to even begin standing row by row, start engaging God in worship, I invite you to do that. Father, Dad, we've joined together in this house today to do a lot more than learning. Lord, we've joined together today to engage you. We've engaged you in the Word. We're engaging you in giving. Lord, and we're going to engage you with praise and active faith and worship and active adoration. Praise that we're going to celebrate you. And worship, we're going to enjoy your, your wonder. And Lord, I pray for whatever needs that these men, women, and students have brought into the room. Those watching online now, And Lord, let us offload them today to you. Offload them today to you as we act as the body and we pray one for another. In your name we pray.